right. For those of you who've joined us, we usually give about 30 seconds to a minute for people to get the coffee and get settled. So I'd like to welcome you to this week's webinar. It's Investing in the Sunshine State's Long Boom. It's a targeted strategy for multifamily investors. I'm Joe Fulvio. I'm sitting in for Will Mucker, who is away at a conference. And I'll introduce to you the gentleman that you see on your screen in just a moment. Um, first, I've got to read his disclaimer and get that out of the way. A camel plan does not provide investment advice or endorsements due to the nature of our industry. We are not an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. If tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other similar expertise is required, the services of a competent professional should be sought. All information and materials presented on Camel Plan webinars and podcasts are provided for educational purposes only. We strongly encourage you to consult with your attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investment. All right, with that out of the way, uh, it seems like uh, everybody is moving to Florida. And I called a guy that I've done business with for, for many years, and we talked about everything that was going on. And I said, well, you know, we need to get together for lunch. And he said, fine, there are great restaurants down here in Orlando. You know, once you fly down to visit, and I was surprised because you know, he had the same phone number he always had. Um, so what was always an established migration pattern to Florida uh, became kind of a flood during the COVID days. And it hasn't seemed to stop, although some regional markets are, you know, looking a bit mature and, and looking kind of slow down or cooled a bit. Um, so, you know, where are we in that? And how do we look at investment opportunities at this stage of the boom? Um, that's why we've invited Nick Sinatra, uh, CEO and co-founder of Sinatra and Company, and Anthony Nanula, chief investment officer and co-owner, to have a look at what's going on down there and what opportunities they're working on now. Um, let me tell you a bit about the guys. Nick has an extensive finance and political experience, including the White House political affairs office during the second Bush administration. And he serves on multiple boards and foundations. Um, uh, and he is a Yale and Wharton grad. Uh, Anthony is also boasts a, an extensional, extensive business and political experience at the state and municipal levels in New York. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's the founder of Essex Homes, a regional home builder in New York state. And he is a graduate of the Syracuse Whitman school of business. So, Guys, with that, I'm going to turn everything over to you. We, we can. I'm going to drop my screen share, and it's all yours. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, can. Wonderful. Well, we're, we're happy to be here, and um, and talk about Florida real estate. So right. now Anthony has. Um, this presentation that we'll walk through, but I you know, want to keep it conversational and, um, you know, just uh, lay out to some of your viewers here why why we're so bullish on on Florida. And, uh, you know, Joe, I'm, I'm one of the people that that's moving to Florida as well. Right. Um, yeah. One of the one of the reasons we love it is because uh, over a million people have moved there um, since the beginning of COVID. And, uh, you know, with with my family. Moving down there soon will be will will be a million and three once we once we get down there. Congratulations, thank you. So, Anthony, where 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 should we start here? How do you want to roll through this? Um, well, good good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, I'm steering the ship, so uh, we've got our own risk disclosures that will. We'll go through this is our presentation um this is probably a good first you know and nick maybe before getting into the presentation you can just share a little bit more about your own perspective on florida uh and and what's driven you and and, and our company to make this major investment we've made there yeah absolutely um we uh, we own and operate over 4,500 units and um, based out of Buffalo have a strong presence in Tampa now as well. Uh, but at one point in time, we were doing um, business in California and Illinois and Indiana as well, and actually bought some properties in Dallas. And, and ultimately 
when we started doing business in Florida, <clears throat> right, uh, right as COVID began, we bought our first asset and um, in Tampa, we just realized how uh, how business friendly it was, right? So that the first piece of it was the business climate uh, uh, is much different in Florida than than what we've experienced in California and, and New York, certainly. Um, so that was the first indicator that this is really uh, there's there's an easier way. You know, we I started the company 15 years ago uh, in our hometown of Buffalo, and so I've been kind of used to dealing with uh, New York and and California business practices. And once we got down to Florida, we started realizing that this that, that that doesn't always have to be this difficult. That was refreshing. <laughs> so that was the first part. Uh, secondly, when um, when we ran into problems in, in, with COVID on the rent collections and um, all the all the challenges of being a landlord during that crazy time, uh, those challenges were much less of an issue in Florida than than they were certainly in in, in New York. So that was that was uh, also very uh, very important to us, and and so we sort of made made a decision that we were going to create a beachhead there, in in Tampa, and we sold off uh, our Dallas assets, and sold off some of our other assets in Illinois and 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 upstate New York to really focus in on on Florida. We have other assets in Indiana and, and Illinois still, and in upstate New York, but our future growth is has been for the last few years and will continue to be in Florida. And um, the it, it's been it's been a great ride. You know, obviously there's there's the demographic piece that I spoke about. There's just the population growth is fantastic. It's a million plus people have have moved to Florida from um, other states since uh, since COVID began. And it's 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 t tends to be people that are looking for uh, relief, economic relief from whatever state they're coming from. And so they are people that tend to be high, high earners, uh, tend to be people that are, are entrepreneurs and, um, people that are, that are sort of accretive to the state, uh, state's economy. Right. Um, and then also you've got, you've got businesses moving there as well. Right. So real estate, the formula for successful real estate, um, investment is, is having, a good business climate, having good population growth, and having good, um, strong uh, economic growth, right uh, in the region, and and so Florida has all that, and and there's other states that do as well. But you know, we just we just said to ourselves, we already had a foothold there with our first asset we purchased in 20, uh, 2021 in Tampa, and 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 said, you know what, we're we're hands-on operators, so we're going to build from a position of strength here down in Florida, and and kind of. Uh, work work from work from Tampa on out throughout the course of um, Central Florida. So um, to this slide, I think uh, for the viewers, a couple other really important elements of this slide are um, not one we're strong sponsor. Well, first of all, the highlight, I want to bury the headline here is that this is, we're targeting an 18 to 20 percent annualized return with a 6% current yield, which is paid quarterly. Uh, and that's over a five-year term. We're really committed for the fund life to be five years. Um, we're hoping to get capital back to investors inside of four years. So um, Nick spoken to the Florida focus. All right, just to reinforce who we are as a company, we, we buy and operate workforce garden style apartment communities and workforce really means ser largely service industry. Um, folks, eds and meds, um, and old, traditionally or typically older vintage, we have a, a brand new construction asset in this fund. But, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I and my family, and we're the largest investor in the company, as well as me being the chief investment officer, is that you're typically buying these assets for about half a new construction or, or better. And typically they're in locations where you could never get the kind of property that at the, certainly at that price um, that uh, we're, we're able to buy. Um, on the sponsor side, you'll hear more about that today, but the company's 15 years old. Um, we now have, uh, we have over a thousand units in the market and we're in our fourth year of operations there. So we've got a really strong footprint in Florida, central Florida. And then, you know, I think also very importantly, the market opportunity. 
um, our whole thesis and the reason why we call it the Florida Value Fund is that we're buying into a, a, a correction in the cycle. And we're, we're able to buy very attractive prices here um, because of the fact the market got overbought the last couple of years. So um, this is kind of a restatement of what I think Nick and I have already presented. Um, I think, you know, one of the things, and, and Nick, you could speak to this if you'd like, we're, we're actually going to add our, our track record of all of our exits um, into the, the presentation. Uh, we'll make it available in our data room as well. But, you know, if you look at this um, right-hand side, there's, we've, we've sold through 3,000 units over the past seven years. And we've averaged a 21% IRR. Yeah, that's a... That's a good point, Anthony. You know, um, a lot of times we forget to tell folks about our great track record. Um, you know, we, we've we been in business now going in for 15 years. We had um, over 20 exits in the course of that time, uh, all, of, all of which were successful. You know, each one of them was uh, in varying degrees of success. Um, so that's, and there's, there's two parts of that, two elements of that. One is it's a great business. The multifamily Real estate business is has been proven to be one of the best investment asset classes in the modern era, um, and so that's the first component of it. It's a really great risk adjusted uh, business, and so second second to that is is operations. Right, we we're operator led company, and we're we're we like to think ourselves as as uh, great operators, and and our track record proves it. So we we have been able to get into um, great investment opportunities, uh, execute on business plans, and then ultimately exit um, in, in a positive way for our investors and ourselves. Um, Nick, anything you want to add to this slide? We kind of we kind of already um, addressed it to some level. No, I, th I think I think we've addressed it. Um, you know, we're we're very bullish on on Central Florida specifically, but the state generally. And um, you know, we have we have an office there. We have personnel there. We've had them there for for a few years now, and we're it's a it's a growing growing operation there. And we're very much hands on down in the market. Um. So you know, I'll 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 kind of kick this slide off, and and certainly Nick, you can fortify it, but. Uh, we, we added recently my father uh, to the slide, kind of to pay homage to him. He passed away a few months ago. And um, he he was a co-founder of a regional su uh, supermarket chain that was very successful. Uh, it went from the meat room to the boardroom as a uh, as an entrepreneur. And and we've we've added his picture to the slide deck here because really he was a mentor to Nick and and also a lot of the operating principles that built a half a billion dollars of enterprise value in top supermarkets and its prime really are being applied to this company. And our family, who has deep roots in uh, food, food-related multi-unit retail, really sees the business similar to running a chain of uh, retail outlets in that uh, you've got to have a strong corporate hub that supports your, in our case, apartment communities. And you have to do a lot of little things right to really create at what we call alpha. You know, one of our themes, and we didn't really stress it in a previous slide, is that operator-led equals increased alpha. And and certainly Nick can speak further to that as the, the leader of the company. But, um, you know, what's important to know about us is that we're not a syndicator, not take, to take anything away from syndicators who, who you've pre been presented to. Um, <clears throat> we're a hands-on operator. Uh, we have our own property management and we have our own construction divisions. And number two, we have a lot of our own capital in this company. Um, we will have a minimum of 10% of the fund of our own capital. And and currently it's closer to 20 uh, through our first closing of uh, of Captiva Apartments. Nick, anything you wanted to add there? No, well said. Well said. Um... You know, I think it's 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 important to point out that um, we also have over 400 investors in the company, and that um, Anthony, your family is the the, the largest 
uh, investor and and uh, has been investing with us for over 12 years now. So I think that that longevity is important to point out that we've uh, we've we're and we're something that we're very proud of. I think uh, one of the no, I just I uh, was just going to jump in on you know yep. speaking of being proud of of uh, longevity, we <laughs> we have a great team, and and um, one of the things that makes us different and unique is that we have had, had folks on the team for a very long time, and it says a lot about us as a company as as operators. Um, Mark, there is my uh, vice yep. president, co-founder. He was a, a co-captain of the high school football team with me, right? So we're we go way back and. Uh, you know, Cole Hatley and Matt Connors have been, Matt actually just shares his, shared his 13 year anniversary with the company. So we have uh, a seasoned team that has um, great credentials and pedigree, but also uh, has been with us. The, 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 the core of our team has been with us for a very long time. And, and um, that experience has jailed over the years and matters. And uh, it, it finds its way into, into our return profile. And it's not something that you sort of see, but you feel it when we when we perform well on these on these um, investments that we've uh, exited. Um, it's also, I think, important to point out that Lori Kroll, who's on the screen here as as our EVP of operations, she's based out of Florida. She's a, a St. Petersburg resident, and uh, it's very involved and has you know, over thirty plus years of experience in the uh, multifamily space in Florida. And uh, it actually, at one point in time, was the uh, president of the Tampa Bay Area Apartment Association. So again, really um, long and 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 uh, experienced down in the market. Um, this this is an important slide to our thesis, um, which Nick can speak to further. Uh, when when we really started putting together the thesis for the fund in the spring of twenty two when pricing really and started to kind of go through the roof in Florida, Central Florida in particular. And um, we were very fortunate that one of Nick's professors at Wharton kind of gave us a glimpse into what became uh, true about the rate spike. And uh, treasuries were maybe at a 130 basis points when Nick and I were able to uh, spend some time in Wharton in the spring of 22. And one of his professors, who's a real estate economist, said, you know, you're going to see treasuries eclipse 5%, which was insane to think of at the time, but it actually happened. And um, there's going to be uh, buyers who got in late in the cycle in Florida who aren't operators and who are going to be overpaying for assets and are going to have floating rate debt. And there's going to be some real buying opportunities and, and kind of a correction in the cycle. And, and part, so part of the thesis was to organize our equity into a, a pooled asset fund to have striking power, but it was also to have uh, kind of turnkey debt. And that that's where Bacadia comes in. Uh, yeah, so Bacadia is a, is a mortgage broker, but they also have their own facilities on their balance sheet. Uh, but we we have a great track record with with Bercadia. So we've been doing uh, debt financings with them for over a decade, and they have been our primary conduit to uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, Fann Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as um, as our as our mortgage solutions. But also have have brought us some great options in the CMBS market and in the uh, debt debt uh, debt fund market. So they're fantastic. They're they're one of the largest um, conduits to the uh, agency lenders in the country. And um, what what's really important about our relationship with them is that they um, they have they have sort of underwritten us and have the track record with us to go to go out to the marketplace and really push for better terms. And not just with lenders, uh, but with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and uh, most significantly um, uh, on the insurance piece, We've been able to get um, very, very good terms with lenders that help us compete on the insurance side of in Florida, right? So we talked about what we really like about Florida. What we don't like is the the high insurance costs, right? And I'm sure that would be something that can maybe come up, and in, in, and I'm sure it will be addressed in the in the Q and A. But I'll just talk about it a little bit now. And there's a there's a specific slide, but since we're talking about it, 
you know, we we see the insurance costs as an opportunity down there. Uh, they're they they're coming off their peaks of last year, um, and and we're seeing a ten to to twenty percent reduction this year in our in our um, um, year over year insurance costs on a per unit basis, and we anticipate them coming down even further. And that's part of our strategy. You know, those that need to sell into that this year are realizing high insurance costs. It's dragging their NOI. Uh, if if we see some um, relief there in the coming years, we're going to be the benefactors of that, uh, owning some of these assets at a better basis. Um, and having Bercadia as our debt partner has allowed us to go in and set some guardrails with lenders on insurance. And that includes higher, de 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 higher deductibles when it matters, and also making sure that the, there is no retrading at the end of uh, uh, an approval period where we may have to put more insurance on than we feel like we need. So that's really important uh, uh, as we as we really scale our growth in, in Florida. Um, for for those of you who are haven't invested in investment real estate, this is kind of the the one hundred one level uh, explanation, right? Um, and it's certainly why my family, who have traditionally been business owners and operators, uh, have invest have become so active with the company. Um, you know, there's strong current income. You're investing in investment assets um with apartments um we've seen an amazing inflation hedge the last few years with uh as a company uh because of the asset class you're able to renew your rents weekly monthly um and the long-term capital appreciation which is very efficient including from estate planning purposes um there's depreciation that comes off the assets the six percent by the way that's earned um in, in the fund that we distribute quarterly is actually a return of, princ of principal. So that's tax deferred. Um, there's no income, annual income tax on that. Um, there, and then we, we put moderate leverage on these assets. So uh, it's very important for you to know as investors that, you know, we're not over leveraging the assets. And um, uh, that's very important in the event that, you know, you do have a, a, some additional correction or, or a period of time where uh, the asset underperforms. Nick, maybe you can speak to this. It's a very fundamental part of our business, kind of the, the unit level renovation programs. Sure. And one of the questions I hear a lot from folks is uh, what makes us different? What's our competitive advantage? There's a lot of folks out there that are going to buy apartments and uh, all over the country, Florida being one of them. And what I point to is is our our operational edge. So we, as Anthony mentioned, we're vertically integrated. We have our own property management company, but we also have our own development company. So we've developed over $400 million of property over the course of the last 15 years. And so uh, not only do we uh, buy existing assets and, and renovate them, we have in the past uh, built them built them new. So we have a great construction management team that oversees that. And in, in this specific strategy and the fund that we're out there right now um, in the marketplace raising uh, is is to buy existing assets and and uh, with the value add strategy, with the value add uh, business plan. So typically we'll go in and we'll see value that uh, can be unlocked through uh, doing some deferred maintenance, upgrading units, maybe... Um, uh, gingerbreading the the amenities mm. or combination a combination of all all of that and so um traditionally we've bought older in vintage assets and we've uh, invested in uh, unit upgrades and uh, you know stabilizing roofs and uh, refreshing parking lots and adding dog parks and thing uh, things of that nature uh, but we're also seeing opportunities in Florida and I'm sure it's 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 everywhere in the country but um in Florida, specifically where we're looking at is you see uh, developers that have uh, built new product and ultimately are not able to convert their construction loan into their floating rate construction loan into a permanent uh, financing, given where rates are and debt yields, et cetera. It's been very difficult for some of these developers to convert their, their financing. And then there's an opportunity because then they have to sell. And in some cases they have to sell 
at a at a discount to what they were hoping to sell or build to when uh, when they originally had their pro forma. So um, the asset we most recently purchased is in Cocoa, Florida, and that was the that was the situation. We uh, we bought it. It was a brand new asset. Uh, we, the, the the developer got the C of O in 2023, and uh, ultimately decided to sell it versus portfolio it. So uh, we thought we think we got we got a great price on it. In fact, we know we got a great price on it because our appraisal was uh, uh, much stronger than the purchase price, which uh, these days you don't find very often. Um, and and but that that asset was an asset that that uh, we ultimately um, are, are not going to spend. Um, as much on the value add, it's more buying right and operating it with our with our um, Sinatra operating principles, where we're going to see our value. So um, for, further to that, this kind of quantifies the power of of uh, being being very effective at unit level renovations, right? Um, I, I actually I caught one thing we glossed over in the last slide. We've done three thousand units over twenty projects, right? I mean that that's a really compelling um, data point. You know, um, we're we're not new at this. <laughs> we're very experienced. <laughs> so, uh, and and it, and it shows up in our returns, right? Um, we average between twenty and twenty five percent return on investment. So if we if we invest a million dollars into a capex, you know, we're going to see two hundred thousand dollars of NOI growth, which is enormous. And how you build value in these properties, NOI is net operating income. So, um, and and the company has really become highly effective at delivering on uh, managing costs with these renovations, um, which is where a lot of syndicators, people who aren't operator led. Uh, tend to stay away from these kind of renovations because you you lose cost control and it's very difficult to manage occupancy when you're doing a massive renovation of a project. And um, it, it's kind of the tag says, unit level renovations can accelerate higher income, which in turn drives outside outside outsized asset values. Anything to add to that, Nick? No, I think you you, uh, you captured it very well. <clears throat> um, Nick, I'll let you take this this slide. It, it's kind of a restatement of what we've been saying, but it's important for people on the call to know. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have over 150 team members, and um, we pride ourselves in, in, in having a great uh, family family uh, focused culture, right? So this is a family run business. Uh, the, the principles, um, uh, the main two, two main principles of the, of the business are on the call right now. But so our family and Anthony's family uh, own the business along with, um, as I mentioned, the co-founder Mark Campano and his family. So uh, it's it's critically important uh, component of who we are, not just financially, but also uh, in, in, in our team. And that's the culture that we have. We're all very close. Um, everybody is in each other's weddings and best best men and godfathers and, and godmothers to uh, to each other's uh, uh, kids, and that's that, that again shows shows up in the in the alpha uh, of the operation. So you know we have over a hundred people in um, in the property management arm, and then over a dozen folks in the construction management arm, and it's a growing it's a growing number, uh, especially down in Florida. And um, you know, I, I can't underscore enough how important that is as it relates to uh, controlling the investment thesis, right? So uh, we just feel like it's so important to 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 have the team focused and on the you know it it, it 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 aligns incentives, right? So our team is on site every day because we own it. We're investors and owners and operators, right? We're not there to to earn a fee property management fee. We're there to create value for ourselves and for our families. And and uh, we have a very unique pay structure too that that reflects that with our compensation compensation packages reflect that with our team members. And and you know we we really want people to um, see financial success personally when these assets do well. And that obviously is a is a positive feedback loop because when people see their paychecks uh, getting stronger, 
um, as the asset gets stronger, that that's when that's when you really start to see happy, happy, happy employees, happy team members. Um, this is a kind of a smattering of our of our holdings. Um, actually, the one on the left hand side, top left, is a uh, was a redevelopment of an old warehouse into fifty luxury apartments and ten thousand square feet of retail. Um, but really, you can kind of see the complexion of the kind of assets we buy. They're typically older vintage. And um, I think one of the things to know about this slide that, that we're actually adding to the deck, we now own 1,140 units in um, Florida, um, flats in Fernwood, residents at Soho and Captiva were the first three we bought Four, there's two in one. And um, there's been somewhere in the neighborhood of $12 million invested in those properties now since 2021. And we've probably done uh, in excess of 500 unit renovations. So we really honed in on the vendor relationships and the construction management personnel and the rest in advance of launching the fund and scaling, um, scaling our balance sheet there. Nick, anything else on this slide? No. Um, so I think we mentioned our um, we mentioned our uh, track record of exits. Um, this is a kind of an imputed track record. Um, a couple of these were sold, um, but others are are um, uh, in the portfolio currently. Uh, I'll point to Greater Rochester Three, which were three assets we bought uh, outside of Rochester, New York. Um, value add, older vintage. I think they really represent what I'm, what Nick and I especially are hoping that we're going to get with uh, an acquisition like our second one uh, in South St. Pete uh, Enclave. In that we paid nearly a seven cap uh, for those of us who know cap rates. Um, the bottom of the market or the top of the market in central Florida was a three cap. The higher the cap rate, the lower the purchase price. <clears throat> it was a undermanaged asset. The seller was in distress. And we've already actually produced a 15% realized return on this asset. All of the investor capital has been returned and the investors annualized 15%. And if we sold it tomorrow, there'd be a 37% annualized return. Now we haven't underwritten that into the into the presentation or into the model, but you can you can get those kind of returns when you buy right, which again is the entire core thesis of this fund. Um, and Nick, I don't know if you want to speak to any of the other properties on here. No, I think I think I think you you captured it. Uh, the essence of it is 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 there. Um, you know okay. we. <clears throat> We we have uh, we have performed and and uh, and various different deals in different parts of the country and and we just think that right now is the is a great time to be buying multifamily in in Florida. And if you notice on the slide, we have a seven million dollar renovation budget for Enclave, our first asset, a value asset in Florida. <clears throat> Under Rochester Three, you can see we we've invested six point four million dollars in that asset. We took the value from seventy million to one hundred thirteen million over four years. So again, you know, a fundamental of that is bought, being bought right, and another fundamental is getting those returns on capex. And they just a real quick uh, time check here. We're 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 at about thirty five minutes. So yeah. Um, Maybe we could just uh, spend another five minutes or so rounding out uh, the presentation and then maybe open it up for some questions. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I think this is an important slide. You can talk, Nick, to why we're focusing in this part of the state. Sure. Yeah, we um, started off the call with, you know, why why Florida? Why do we like Florida? And um you know, just drilling down a little bit further geographically, there's certain areas we feel like are are better uh, than others. Um, we think Central Florida has a an outsized opportunity 
uh, as it relates to workforce housing, right? So um, South Florida has been a very strong place for people to invest over the course of, of, of uh, different cycles. Uh, it's it's sort of popular with international investors, obviously, with Miami and and Fort Lauderdale and Naples. But uh, our our core focus is 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 in the red here, which is of kind of a what I'll call the the a very wide central Florida, right? So you're talking um, Gainesville down through Fort Myers and over through Palm Beach County and up towards Daytona, and that includes the I four corridor, which is the main. Uh, um, vein if you will cu cutting cutting through central central florida that we love we think there's a ton of growth there um it, it's it's more affordable uh than south florida uh and and, and we think that uh given given the um the job growth that we're seeing in some places like west palm beach and uh and st petersburg uh that that that's a really right place to be investing over the next five years so um Next slide is, uh, these are the two assets, uh, one we own on the left and the second one we're about to purchase. If you wanna just really quickly run through those, Nick. Sure, so the, I, I alluded to it earlier, but this this one on the on the left, as you're looking at the screen is, uh, is in Cocoa, Florida. It's, it's the Space Coast. So Space Force Base is right right in that neck of the woods. You've got uh, uh, Blue Origin and, and um, uh, other various um, auxiliary businesses and, and companies, if you will, that they're all feeders into the exploding uh, uh, space industry, right? So we like that uh, for obvious reasons in, in, in that area. So we, we this is an anchor project for us in the Space Coast. We anticipate buying a lot more in that area. But this one uh, is a new build, as I mentioned, about 12 miles off the coast, uh, off of Cocoa, Cocoa Beach, which is a, it's one of the nicest beaches in all of Florida and all of America. And we bought it for 64.3 million. We actually had an appraisal done by the, by the, by our lender for $68 million. Um, but it's 268 units. And, um, uh, we, we, we just are thrilled by, by the, by the property. And, um, you know, we took it over end of July. So we're, we're within, you know, basically 30 plus days worth, of of owning it and managing it and putting in our um our, our business plan which is really going to be um sprucing up the amenities uh, adding in a, a, a additional landscaping and uh, and operating it well and then on on the other side of it is this uh as anthony mentioned it earlier is in sound st pete which we think is a really hot growing market uh and this this one is called the enclave apartments uh, we're going to rebrand it this one's a 1974 vintage asset 240 units. Uh, we think it's a great price, $160,000 a door. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the cap rate six and a half. I mean, that's a, it's a really, it's a really attractive cap rate going, especially uh, as we anticipate over the course of time, cap rates are just going to, they're, they're going to compress. Nobody knows how much or when, but they will over the course of the next few years in, uh, in central Florida. So we like this uh, entry point on the purchase price. As Anthony mentioned, we're going to go in there with a seven million dollar capital improvement budget, and and really modernize this asset, rebrand it, re-establish, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of modern modern look and feel, new flooring, new cabinets, counter ca countertops, and uh, the asset's going to look totally different after uh, we we put on our business plan. We're really excited about um, you know what what possibilities are there in this in this market. Um, so, you know, we're kind of running short on time. What, one, one thing that, that's important to know is that, um, you know, this isn't a bl traditional blind pool fund. We've already bought an asset. We have another asset under contract that most will buy one to two more assets and we'll probably close the fund by the first quarter. So, you know, we, we actually size the fund with that in mind. So, um, you know, as an investor, you can kind of know what you're buying based upon what we already own and what we're purchasing. Um, you know, uh, Nick, you're you're the expert on insurance, but you know, I think this second slide, which we recently added, is is powerful. It really speaks to our thesis that you know insurance rates hit their peak and are starting to correct and have a lot more room to correct. 
So I don't know if you want to just quickly kind of walk through this. Sure. Yeah. So as you're looking at the slide here in the blue, those are the assets that we own. Um, the Cocoa Grand Act asset actually is the first one in the green. We own that now too. But I think what what you really have to look at is the per unit number here um, at the bottom uh, and kind of where where they where they were and where they where they are. So we bought Captiva, which is in Tampa, last year, and the 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 per unit uh, price point was was actually over uh, three thousand dollars a door. So it's come down substantially, even even year over year. And that and the, we're at twenty four hundred dollars a door right now um, at Captiva. So that's that's been a big improvement. Um, same for Flats and Fern, which is two other assets that we own in Tampa, and Soho, which is our our, our fourth asset in Tampa. This is all they've all come down year over year. They now they certainly spiked quite a bit unexpectedly post Hurricane Ian. So that that wasn't uh, um, something that that anybody appreciated. But what's nice about the strategy moving forward is that we really feel like we're off the peak and, and we're on our way down. And, and so if you look at the average per unit, it's um, uh, $1,800 a door, which is um, right in line with what we're seeing for, for the, the uh, Enclave asset in St. Pete. And, and we locked in 1670 a door for Coco Grand, which is a heck of a lot better than we thought we would do even when we under underwrote it six months ago or four months ago, as we, as we purchased the property, as we got the property under contract from the seller. So uh, we're, we're already seeing the thesis manifest itself as, um, as, as insurance is coming down year over year, we anticipate it to continue to come down uh, next year and, and to see even better, stronger uh, um, discounts to, to peak. Uh, if, as, as sort of, if we get through the remainder of the hurricane season, without a whole, a, a, a storm that dam that does a bunch of damage. So that's the one sort of variable, right? I mean, every, every one of these deals, uh, you know, every investment has risk, right? And, and so for, for us, we are making a bet that insurance is coming down over the course of the, the, the life of this fund, right? And so even if there were to be uh, another storm that cre creates a lot of damage, you know, it's uh, the, the key piece is, well, you know, when does that happen? And, and you know that that's why we have some flexibility and and when we, we when we would ultimately exit some of the assets. So, um, you know, we we feel good about that. We've fortified that risk the best we can in terms of having proper insurance and and uh, proper insurance coverage, but uh, also um, being pretty uh, modest in in what we see as uh, decreases. Right. So um, on the on the upside, if if things really start to slide down and we get some great pricing. I mean, some of these returns that we're looking at could be even better. On the downside, if insurance doesn't do as well as we think it will, you know, that's going to um, be reflected as well. So these these next few slides, and then we'll get into the summary of terms. This, this really is, a, I think, a great way to finish today. Um, these are assets we own in the market that we bought going back to 2021. And it's kind of the, the thesis of our value fund you know, in kind of a couple slides, right? We bought Flats and Fernwood um, at uh, 145,000 a door. We were at a 475 cap rate. That's where the market was going into the fall of 21. We saw this run up through the spring, summer of 2022, where the market just got overbought. And uh, we saw, you know, cap rates go down to three or door prices go to as high as 220. This is all older vintage uh, acquisitions. We actually bought our second asset. It's called uh, Residences at Soho, but it was called New River. So we, you know, arguably we paid a little higher than uh, we would have liked to in the cycle. However, that that price was originally two hundred five a door. We were actually the rate started spiking and prices started to decline. Um, if you look over to the right, our target when we underwrote the fund was a six and a quarter cap rate or one hundred and fifty a door. Enclave here, we're closer to a 675 cap rate, right? So again, bought right is half sold. Um, and uh, same goes for new construction. Um, you know, if you look at the cap rates, they were 420, 270, and two a door in 21. We were paying a, almost a five, we paid almost a five cap and 240 a door for Coco Grant. I mean, on this asset, 
you know, unlike unlike Enclave over the work to do, um, just operating this asset and and organically growing its net operating income and getting a forecast is going to give all of us a really nice return on this asset in the coming few years. And finally, in 70 years of recorded history in real estate has proven this, that values tend to eclipse or high water mark as they recover, right? So part of a very fundamental part of our thesis is we just get back to where values were before the run-up uh, based upon where we priced, where we bought these assets, and we're going to do very well in the fund. So um, one thing that I guess we'd like to believe is a bit of a sense of urgency here, if you're interested in investing, is that the window we don't believe of this kind of pricing is going to last very long. And, you know, we wrote this deck in the spring. Um, we're already seeing rates go down. And, you know, it's just going to be a matter of time before that's going to drive pricing up. And so we're trying as best we can here to, to grab as many assets as we can during this period. Um, so the, the summary of terms, pretty straightforward. Um, we have two asset classes, investor classes. We have a, for a 500,000 minimum is our class A and 100,000 minimum is our class B. Um, again, our target 75 to 100 million. Um, again, we underwrote a 6% current yield, which we're actually reserving for in our capital stack. And then uh, the investors make 100% so they get their original capital back and make 100% until you've annualized a 12% return on the A units and a 10% uh, yeah, for the B. So, you know, we, we structured this almost to be like a preferred equity with a big upside. And then we're, we're 50, 50 as a sponsor over that. Um, we're very strident on our five-year target. Um, we do have the opportunity to own assets longer up to seven years, but the thesis is buy these right, add value, recap them and sell them and return capital and return return. So, um, uh, and again, I think it's important to know that, you know, we're a minimum of 10% of the fund or with our own capital. Um, our fees are pretty standard in the industry. We're actually a little lower than standard on, on our sponsor fee, uh, management fee. And then our, our rest of our fees for property management and construction management are right in line with, the uh, with industry. So, um, with that, Joe, we can hand it over to you. I think we were pretty close on time. Excellent. Right? Excellent. Yeah, that's a good summary right there for those of you who who are interested. Uh, and you mentioned access to the data room and the, the past projects. Um, uh, anybody that's interested, I think if you want to share contact information, if you've got that, um, if there's a slide that you have that has, you know, email and phone, that would be good. There is. <clears throat> yeah, let's see if we can get at that. In the, in the meantime, there are a couple of things. Uh, yeah, thanks for going into the detail on the thesis. That, that was really, really well explained and um, a nice reference to the supermarket business, which has some inter interesting parallels I hadn't thought of before. And the team description was solid. Uh, George wants to know um, what gingerbreading of amenities is. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, Joe, for bringing that up and uh, I'll I'll answer this one, and I'm going to have to let my partner Anthony take the rest of the questions. I have to jump on to a, a one o'clock. No worries, no worries. We're glad but, to have had you here. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, and this is this has been a lot of fun. So hopefully everybody enjoyed um, hearing we hearing our our view on on Florida apartment uh, investing. So gingerbreading of of amenities would just be, um, it's a it's a just sort of my my fun way to talk about um, elevating what's existing there, right? So for example, um, getting, uh, but, you know, installing better landscaping, right? Installing better lights, uh, more, um, you know, more meaning, you know, meaning, you know, if there's, if there's uh, one dog park, maybe you put two dog parks in, 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 in different areas of the, of the property. And in our case, in this cocoa grand asset, we're actually going to put a playground in there. Um, you know, in some cases we've want, want, uh, gone in there and put um, 
you know, Amazon delivery parcel packages nice. uh, um, in there. We've added, um, you know, updated gyms, new equipment, gym equipment, uh, fitness equipment in there. Um, we've upgraded common common area bathrooms and and uh, common area spaces. Uh, and in some cases, we've completely overhauled the uh, the clubhouse as well, right? In this case, the Coco Grand asset, the clubhouse is phenomenal. It's a beautiful cl existing clubhouse. Uh, and the pool area is already pristine with great um, 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 furniture, if you will. But sometimes we go in there and we really elevate the pool furniture and and make that more of a, a spa-like setting. So mm, okay. hopefully it gives you a little bit of an example of what we've done and, and kind of what, what that term means. But again, thanks, Joe. Anthony right. uh, um, can can handle it from here and uh, appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll be talking to some we folks uh, offline. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll catch up with you later. Thanks for your time Great. today. Thank you. All right. One other, one other gingerbreading, and really I think we were using that more in reference to um, Coco Grand, which is, you know, brand new construction. Mm -hmm. To tell everyone how brand new it is, it was literally put in service in December of 23. Wow. Okay. So, um the, the developer's production home builder for Phoenix. Well, he didn't know it's really important to screen in porches in Florida, right? <laughs> so there's 268 units and they don't have screened in porches. So that is a phenomenal, we've learned with the thousand or more units we have that um, that is a 100% return CapEx project, meaning it's we spent about $1,200 to put in these uh, screen porches and we get a $100 ramp up on average nice. right nice. so um that that's hopefully you know a little bit more of the story there that's interesting yeah and that's a term i'm going to steal by the way um, gingerbread yeah ginger, <laughs> i love it i love it um the one final question is you know you've discussed that you're buying into a dip there's property targeting in terms of uh you're operating in a vein of the market that's somewhat undesirable to other operators you talked about an an end or a you, you're buying into this this dip and that the dip will likely end, and um, which is it's a good nod toward the changes in market conditions that often surprise um, experienced uh, operators. Uh, can you go into are there any other aspects of risk that um, that you consider and and how have you done your risk mitigation on that? Well. To, to the first um, part of your question, um, the, these are very desirable assets, right? Um, and meaning, you know, this asset class is is probably one of the, and I'll say this as an investor, right? We we always like to say we wish we had been investing in this asset class thirty years ago, hmm. um, but uh, you know, it, it's. It's among a few in real estate today. Self storage is another one. Um, industrial is cool, but industrial was one for a while that um, I think should be part of anybody's portfolio, right? Uh, because of its its income reliability, its its uh, being recession proof, uh, having a wide addressable uh, renter base, etc. So, um, in terms of how long the opportunity could exist. You know, the, if you're selling in this market right now, you're a motivated seller, meaning you don't want to sell, right? Um, you have a rate cap that's that's expiring. Um, you've got uh, uh, an agency loan that's coming due, or you know, like in the case of the Coco Grand asset, you're a developer and you you overbuilt and you've got to sell assets, mm. right? So I mean, you know, we're we're buying into other people's to some degree, other people's distress, right? Um, now, is rates correct? Is insurance costs correct? You know, that that's going to dissipate, number one. Number two, institutional capital. You know, the big uh, insurance companies and public REITs and whatnot, they would have typically been the buyer of Coco Grant, hmm. right? They're sitting on their hands right now. Institutional capital has made it very clear you know what we want to they don't they don't want to be they don't need to be first nobody wants to be the guy getting fired because he's first right warren buffett says he's greedy when people are scared and he's scared when people are greedy, greedy. Absolutely. right yeah. and people are are still a bit scared there's uns, not scared but more uncertain right 
you know, we get through this election cycle and we see a 50, 100 basis point rate cut in Fed rates, you're going to see buyers flood into this market. And I don't know how many more opportunities there'll be that, that are priced this way, right? Um, so I think for anyone who's interested, I would really encourage you to move forward <laughs> because, right. um, you know, there might not be a third or fourth buy even. It's just because hmm. we're not going to chase deals. We don't need to, you know. Um, so conversely, on the risk side, you know, my personal view is we're through the riskiest part of the cycle, right? Um, we're through treasuries that were already over five. We're at insurance uh, value, insurance costs that were over 3,000 a door. Um, and um, I do think insurance continues to be a concern. Um, one thing we didn't cover in the interest of time was that the governor of Florida and the legislature passed a reform uh, program last year in the, in the legislative session that had a, a major impact on bringing insurers back into the market because uh, there were anti-fraud protections for the industry and um, there was tort reform, right? Um, the governor and the legislature have made it clear if they have to, they don't want to, but they'll have to put a reinsurance program together if we, we have uh, an uncharacteristically uh, damaging hurricane season. Mm. And our view of that is because we're in the workforce housing sector, that they're going to have to address our sector with reinsurance. You know, if you if you look right now, you know, the amount of, of rent that a tenant's paying to cover insurance has quadrupled, mm. right? It's tough to have affordable housing, which is, is, you know, a concern for the growth trajectory of Florida without having affordable rents, right? So it's a controllable to the extent the government can help us push those numbers down if they need to. I mean, what we've seen in 30 years of, of, of studying that we've done in the insurance uh, industry, going back to Hurricane uh, Andrew in the early uh, 90s or Katrina in New Orleans, was that rates tend to spike. And, and Hurricane Ian was particularly bad because where it hit, it hit Naples and other wealthy mm -hmm. areas of Florida. There was more damage in Hurricane Ian than in Katrina from a dollar value perspective because of where it hit, mm. right? So, um, and by the way, I'm happy to report we've never had any claim in the four years we've been in the business now. So we're, we're very particular about where we buy as well relative to uh, hurricane uh, impact zones. But okay. if, if it, what, what 30 years of history has shown is that rates spike and then they trickle down and then they stabilize. Right. We're already seeing that in Florida. So um, but that's a risk. It's definitely a risk. Um, but uh, I, and I and I don't see any other risk. I mean, you, you will not have um, you're not going to have rent deflation in a market where you're underhoused. I mean, we're, you could argue we're underhoused across the country, but certainly we're underhoused in central Florida uh, and, and especially in our asset class workforce multifamily and where you have population growth, right? So, and we're not underwriting 10, 15% rent inflation. You know, we're very standard. Um, our only rent bumps are from after our uh, our renovation projects for, for uh, properties like Enclave. After that, it's standard 3%. Okay. All right. Thanks for going into so much detail on that. That's great. I know I said it was the last question, but we do have one final sure. question. Uh, is this qualified DST? And I do not know what that means. No, it's the no. DST is right. the Delaware Statutory Trust. Uh, all right, uh, we we'd love to take uh, uh, 1031 money. We what we can do for a larger investor is put them directly into an asset if you're over a couple million bucks. Um, we've done that before uh, at the asset level, but uh, we we are not uh, a, D a Delaware Statutory Trust, a DST. Okay. All right. Well, we're just like one minute to the top of the hour. And so, Anthony, I thank you so much for coming in and, and sharing what you guys are up to. Very interesting presentation. I want to thank everyone who um, sat in with us today as an attendee. You'll get a copy of this. Or you get a link to a copy of this presentation so you can listen to it at your leisure. And those of, uh, those of you who received the replay and, um, and watch it, please uh, submit comments. Um, 
We do have a comment function there, so you can tell us what you think. Uh, join us next week, same time. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be back in the saddle, and uh, we'll have somebody else just as interesting as Anthony and, and Nick. Anyway, take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.